Welcome to The Robin Graham Show, the podcast for purpose-driven women who want to achieve sustainable success without having to be on social media. Hey, beautiful friends. Welcome back to another episode of The Robin Graham Show. I have a unique guest with me today. She is an inventory genius. Now, don't let the phrase inventory throw you off because even if you aren't a product-based business or a storefront business, we're going to be talking about things like your assets and don't get overwhelmed if I mentioned balance sheet or profit and loss statement, but we're going to be talking about even debt and ROI and all these things that at the end of the day are so critically important for your success. And if you're not looking at your numbers, you're not going to succeed. So even as a service-based business, you have assets, you have things in your business that you need to keep track of to hold yourself accountable for looking at checking in with and managing your expenses if you want that bottom line number to be something where you can actually get a paycheck for yourself as well. So that is what we're diving into today. And I think you're going to learn a lot and be really inspired too. Without further ado, Sierra Stockland, welcome to The Robin Graham Show. Hello, I'm so excited to be here today. I am so happy you're here. I enjoyed reading your book and I'm going to hold it up for anybody that is watching on YouTube. It is called Inventory Genius. And in the book, Sierra goes through her journey, which I'm going to let her share with all of you because it was one where she literally took her losses, her mistakes, and she is now using them as wins to help other people. And I think in the entrepreneurial space, that's something that we can all hold a light to because so many of us, if we make mistakes, we want to hide them or we feel ashamed. But the reality is every mistake we make allows us to then turn around and help someone else. So Sierra, will you please tell the listeners a little bit about your journey and what brought you to where you are today? Yes, absolutely. So um, born and raised in Fargo, North Dakota. That's always a fun fact for everyone. Um, we now live in Nashville. So we finally escaped the winters after 40 plus years. Um, but I'm a third generation entrepreneur. My dad and grandpa both owned a small business. So I was always around small business conversation. Every Easter lunch, every Christmas dinner, they were talking about business. Um, I started my first business when I was 13 and it wasn't necessarily on purpose. I filled um, a void. I was a homeschool student and there was no theater opportunity. So I started a little acting company and people started coming to me. Um, by the end of my high school year, my high school senior year, I had a full on acting company, high school, college, grade school, Christian homeschool, public school kids. We put on full length productions. Um, and so that was my first business of a decade. And then got married and had a couple little ones. And I was done with the nonprofit nights and weekends. So I thought. So I thought the next idea would be to go into retail, which is nights, weekends, and holidays. Um, but really excited to open my first store in 2006. It was a brick and mortar maternity and baby boutique. And then just six months later, opened a second um, inventory based retail concept um, selling overstock and designer liquidation product. So I had two retail stores going at the same time. One was my dream store. The other one appealed to the masses. So that was really my first um, lesson in selling what the customer wants, not what you want the customer to want. Um, so we ended up combining both concepts and created a designer outlet boutique, which I then franchised. We built that and grew it into a franchise system. We had 13 stores around the country, um, ran that for many years. And in 2015, I look back now and I remember 2015 specifically because I was invited to the White House a couple times. I spoke on Capitol Hill on behalf of small business. I was very much in the limelight in Entrepreneur Magazine. I was selling franchises. I finally had the corner office and the massive warehouse, but I could feel that something wasn't right. And I remember telling one of my team members, um, I feel like something's brewing, like something's not quite right. And I told my husband the same thing. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like you're a seven figure business. You, you know, from the outside looking in, I looked like everything was, you know, rolling quite along. But um, two years later, it all imploded. We had um, a mutiny on the bounty, if you will, with some franchisees and ended up losing everything. So we had to close the business. We lost everything, including our home. 
um, which was tied to our financing. We won all the lawsuits, but lost everything to the attorneys. And um, and so I had to start all over. So in 2018, um, I launched a new concept, a subscription box for boutique retailers. And through that really started my healing journey of knowing that not everyone in the world was out to get me, that God did have a plan. Um, and I needed to use my, my talents and what I had learned along the way to help other entrepreneurs. And so that's how I ended up coaching and consulting, um, which is what I'm doing today. And I absolutely love it. And I feel like God used that 20 years of business experience, lots of wins, but lots of losses um, to really help me be a very empathetic and wise and discerning coach for my clients. I, d I love everything you just said, and I love how vulnerable you are to tell your story and that you lost everything because that had to be terrifying. And I would think it would take quite a bit of time to heal because there's so many emotional facets to this with the people that, you know, sued you and this, that, and the other. Um, what I, what I love though, is that you brought empathy into it. And I think as Christian entrepreneurs, that is such a huge part of who we are and how we serve. And I, anyway, I appreciate that. Yeah. So the other, so, so you briefly mentioned, and this is, this conversation is going to go a little off track, but you briefly mentioned the, you lost your home because that was part of the funding. You had to have collateral, collateral. So let's talk about debt in business for a second, because I think yeah. this is something that is, it it can be beneficial if you have the opportunity to make the money and you have that security. But if you don't, and you, you, if you're not wise with your, let's put in air quotes, inventory, which yeah. as a service provider, that inventory could be anything. It could be the office space you rent. It could be the, you know, classes you take certifications, you know, anything. So yeah. Okay, so I'm going to turn that over to you and let you talk about that for a minute, like the good debt, the bad debt, and and how we weigh that. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, I should find a stat on, a more, a more recent stat on this, but <clears throat> the last time I looked, I think so over 68% of entrepreneurs have debt, <clears throat> excuse me, um, between 100000 up to a million dollars in debt, and this is small business entrepreneurs. So the majority of entrepreneurs have some sort of debt and some debt is harder to secure, you know, like an SBA loan or a line of credit. Some debt is very easy credit card debt. So we find that very, very common. A lot of times amongst inventory based business owners, although I'm service only and I get these offers all the time as well, mm -hmm. capital loans. So PayPal will say, oh my goodness, you've qualified for $40,000. Click this button. You can have it today. And it is as literally as easy as that. Mm -hmm. And so people will take on debt a lot of times because they're bleeding cash, their cash flow is negative and they're bleeding cash. And they think, okay, I just need this little bit of money to get over the hump, to cut rent, to cut payroll checks, and I'll be good. But what they don't understand is they need to understand why they're in that position. And if you don't understand why you're bleeding cash and what's going wrong with the cash flow, taking on more debt is only going to add to that burden. And so I never say that debt is bad because I think there's a time and a place for it. You're buying a building, you want financing. Let's use cheap money instead of all of our cash to do some of these things. You can use a credit card very efficiently. You know, I have clients that use an Amex buy all their inventory, pay it off every month. Really, it's like a line mm -hmm. of credit. But the majority of debt that entrepreneurs have, they've taken on because they feel stuck. They feel stressed. And that is not a good time to, to take on debt. And so there's a difference there. Um, you know, we had an SBA loan. And so for us, like our, our house was collateral because most inventory-based businesses don't have a lot of assets. And so that's what they're going to take. And so when you can't, you know, if you have a personal guarantee and you can't fulfill that, that obligation, they come calling. Same thing with leases, right? A lot of times a lease has a personal guarantee on it and people don't even know that or think about it. They just sign. So when I talk to clients and they're signing news, I'm like, are they requiring a personal guarantee? If at all possible, can we get out of that? Can we not have to sign that personal guarantee? Because if you can't pay that rent, 
your house is tied to that. Your bank account's tied to that and they will come and, and require that of you. Yeah, and, and that can be kind of scary. What I find interesting is that like the average small business owner makes $68,692 a year. And it's not, that doesn't sound like an exorbitant amount of money, especially if you have a loan to pay back. So I like how yeah. you put the perspective of why, why are you getting that? So because we're in the coaching industry, both you and I, and we have coaching clients, what are your thoughts on, you know, when somebody comes and says, oh, I, I really need coaching. I really, really need the help, but I can't afford it. Yeah. So one option would be to take out a loan or to put it on credit card, but pay it back. Don't let it build on top of all of your other expenses. What, how do you, how do you look at that? How do you, how do you approach that with your clients? Yeah. You know, that's interesting because there's definitely a wide swing in philosophies out there. I mean, you'll hear, and I'm sure you have many coaches that say, put it on a credit card. You need this, blah, 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 blah. I'll never push someone to pay for something they don't feel like they can afford. Um, and then you have the other extreme that are like, I would never, ever tell anyone to ever pay for it with a credit card. So I would, I would run down the middle and say, okay. And in fact, I'll give you an example. Yesterday, talk to a potential client. Um, she does a little over a million dollar in top line revenue. And so I know she fits into the qualification of what she can afford. Cause I look at those bases. I, there's a couple basic numbers for her though. She's coming to me and most people do because they have a lot of debt. They have no cash. They're not paying themselves. Like they're in a financial bind. And so the thought of paying someone <laughs> to help them get out of that, that's just hard to overcome. And so she said, I really want to do this. I know that it's going to help me. I just don't know how am I going to pay for that? Like, where's that going to come from? And so I always tell my clients this, first of all, I can hold the belief for you that it will work because I've seen it work. So they have not, right? That's why they're in this position. But I know the framework that I have and the tools that I can give them. If they follow it, I know the results it will produce just like your, you know, you do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so I always tell them my goal is that you make, save, or find your investment with me every month. And most often we'll do that on the very first call <laughs> times 10, because I can look at things that they just, the reason they're in this problem is because they can't see the forest from the trees. I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs looking at their financials, helping them find cash flow, helping them pay off hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. So I can look at a set of financials really quickly and say, here's an issue. There's an issue. Let's fix this. Let's do that. And right away, we find that return on investment that they've made mm -hmm. with me. So instead of pushing people to just trust me, I'm amazing. And, you know, I'll, I'll help you put it on a credit card or saying to them, well, until you save up all the money and come back, I would rather say, let's ensure that you make, save or find your investment with me. Let's require and I want you to require of yourself a that you're going to get a return on investment. Show up, do the work, listen to what I tell you to do. And I know based on the information you've already given me that we'll be able to see a return on that. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're like for what you're doing, you have the opportunity to increase revenue from sales. You have the opportunity to decrease expenses, um, increase margin. Like you're really looking at everything, which is is not dissimilar to what I do as far with except with service-based people yeah, and entrepreneurs. Um, because there's so many times you see expenses that people don't even realize they have, or they've forgotten that they, yes. they're just paying something automatically and they don't even realize they're still paying it until, oh my gosh, I've spent a thousand dollars on this tool and I've never even used it. Yeah, um, And I see that happen a lot, but it's also looking at offers and pricing. Because yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's, yeah, you're, it's, it's pricing. Like we don't have mm -hmm. to find a single extra customer and really, I mean, let's cut the fat off of the OPEX, but you can't grow business by cutting expenses. So we're going to run out of expenses to cut. Yeah. We can grow your bottom line by fixing your pricing, yeah. by giving you that mindset of like, get out of your customer's wallet. That is not your job to decide how much they can or are willing to pay. Um, and that can change profitability and cash flow very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And upselling. So if you have a current offer, how can you take that and extrapolate it? And yeah. how can you look at the clients you already have 
and use them to generate more revenue versus being on a hamster wheel of constantly trying to find new people. And I think that's a big, and I know you mentioned this in the book too, that's a huge obstacle I think people face. Like they've got to grow their Instagram followers or their TikTok followers, and that's going to be the solution. But that's not the solution. The solution is actually using the people, not using in a bad way, but reaching out to, um, to continuing those relationships with the people that are already in your community. Yeah. And that could be as simple as, you know, a referral fee, like, Hey, I really appreciated the fact that you trusted me to work with me. And I would love to have you be a voice for me. And here's a referral fee for doing that. Or, you know, creating a new offer and bringing them in for that or upselling them from one offer to another. There's so many different ways, but I think like you said, you can't see the forest from the trees it, or, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And so having those extra eyes on our business can make a significant difference in what the ultimate ROI is. And I love right. that you mentioned ROI because I like to say, you know, when, when someone works with you or someone works with me or someone works with a health coach, when you look at the, the amount of money you're paying for that amount of time, you're not only paying for that amount of time, you're paying for results and opportunities to generate additional revenue or to live a happier, healthier lifestyle for years to come, which ultimately does decrease your cost of living and improves your your bottom line. So it's a win-win, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think we have to look at that and expect that we're going to get an ROI. So people sign up for things And then they wait for the coach, you know, let's just take health. So I'm a triathlete. I have a triathlon coach. I can't sign up and pay her and expect that she is going to make me a certain way. She's going to give me the tools, but I have to put the work in. I have to show up, I have to communicate with her when I'm feeling like I can't handle the schedule or whatever that looks like. It's up to me to expect the ROI. So she just gives me the tools to do that. And I think a lot of times, you know, we go into programs and we expect if I sign up for this, they promise X, Y, Z. So I'm going to sign up and sit sit back and wait or get overwhelmed and not do the work instead of saying, you know what, my expectation is I will absolutely get my return on investment. I am going to get my money's worth. I'm going to show up for everything. I'm going to do all the work um, and I'm going to have that mindset. So it's just very different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it really is about the work. You have to put in the work if you want to be successful. And I think looking at everything that you wrote about in the book and knowing our numbers, that takes work. And sometimes it doesn't feel good at all, but we have to do it if we want to stay on top of things. So let's talk about some of those things to look at. So the balance sheet, the profit and loss statement, like where do we want to focus our, our eyes, our energy on so that we know that our numbers are okay. And I think I have to say, I think one of the things that you talked about in the book too, you you kind of mentioned in passing several times is not taking a paycheck. So listeners, if you're not taking a paycheck, pay attention to what Sarah is going to say here. Yeah. The one thing, um, when we shot down our retail business and, um, you know, and lost everything and I started up the boutique box. So that was my subscription box business. I decided that I would never pay an employer or a vendor more than myself ever again. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't. I mean, there's a time and a place where a CEO should make more than a founder or could make more or you're bringing an expert in. But for me personally, I had come from having built a seven figure business, multiple locations, a team of 12 plus people, a corner office, and I wasn't paying myself. In fact, there was a time in our business where my husband was working, depositing his paycheck into the company bank accounts so we could write payroll for people. And I look back and I'm like, what was I thinking? But I want to encourage the listeners, if that is you, do not feel ashamed because in the moment you do truly feel like that's the, you get trapped in the singing, like it's the only thing I can do. It's my only option. Um, I'm going to go back to a paycheck in a minute, but I want to leave this little nugget. I want to drop this here. I tell my daughter, she's 18, um, almost 19 all the time. You always have options. I did not know that or think that way. And I'm a very optimistic problem solving type of person, but we feel like we don't have options. I talk to entrepreneurs that are like, I can't close my business. I'm like, you can do whatever you want. Now there's consequences for things, but you can do whatever you want. You definitely could close today. You could just lock up and walk away if you want. 
really? Yeah. I mean, there's a consequence to that, but you can. And so I felt in the, that moment, like my only option was to keep paying these people and to, you know, and that wasn't. So if you're listening, I want you to think about this. I have options. I always have options. And what are those options? And there's extreme options. And then typically we land on something if we think through it, you know, kind of in the middle of those extremes, but with a paycheck, um, I just think that's really important. There's this lie we've been fed as entrepreneurs. We hear it everywhere. Don't pay yourself, reinvest it back into the business. Your due will come. I mean, I told myself that lie, like one day I'll get my paycheck. One day I'll get my paycheck. Why would we work for free? Now we might not work for what we're truly worth, right? But a $50 a week paycheck is better than zero. And so start with something, get consistent with that, make that a routine. Um, you will grow very bitter in your business and you'll resent your people. You will resent your customers if you work for free for too long. That is just human nature. And so we don't want to have you get to that place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And my bookkeeper has has said this before too, that she, when working with her clients, if the, R, the IRS can look at you as more of a hobby than a business if you aren't actually paying yourself. So I don't yeah. know what the data is on that or anything, but I just, I know she has said that before because I fell into that trap for a long time where, no, yeah. I'm just going to keep putting it in the business. I'm just going to keep putting it in the business. That way, if I decide, you know, to go into a coaching program or do this or that, the money's there, but yeah. she convinced me otherwise. And actually it's very counterintuitive. So what we think we're doing is not actually working. So when you don't pay yourself and you say, well, I'm just going to reinvest it. I'm just going to reinvest it. Now you could do that for, let's say you say, I'm going to do that for the first six months, right? So you put some sort of deadline on it or a period of time or a season that's different than this perpetual, like I'm never going to pay myself. Um, I have a client right now that's aggressively tackling debt. And so we said, you know, for the next, I think we decided six months, we're going to put your paycheck on hold and we're going to aggressively attack the debt. And then what we're putting towards the debt becomes your paycheck, you know, so there's, there's a time and place, but this idea that we'll just keep reinvesting it actually does harm. Um, it's like taking on debt without understanding why you need it. The same thing about, you know, not taking a paycheck. When you keep saying, I'm going to reinvest it in the business, you don't truly look at what are my profit goals? What do I need to do to have a healthy business? If you've budgeted yourself and your paycheck in just like you would any other pay, mm -hmm. paycheck person, you know, employee, you're going to make a few more sales. You're going to cut a few more expenses. You're going to increase your prices a little bit because that paycheck's non-negotiable and you'll find that you can pay yourself and do the coaching and mm -hmm. buy that software app, right? Um, but if you say, well, I'm not going to have the money, then you're not going to have the money. Like that's just mm -hmm. how it works. Yeah, absolutely. Our thoughts create our results, right? Yes. <laughs> what yes. we believe and yeah, absolutely. So in the book you talked about, and I loved this because, and I think I actually did a podcast episode about this not too long ago, but um, Myron Golden, if you've ever listened to him, he's big on this too, that- um, you make money for money to make more money, not, yeah. you know, and I think you talked about that in the book that cash is king. And that sounds so like cliche and inappropriate almost, but yeah, we have to have assets. And I would love for you to talk about that and how the more cash we have, the better off we'll be long-term because of the fact that we can invest that, get interest, and our money is going to continue to make money for us. And that's how the rich get richer is yeah. they use the cash they have and they reinvest it or invest it. So yeah, when you talk about assets in the business, yes, cash would be an asset, but what are some of those other assets that people can look at and consider when they're doing their balance sheet? Yeah. So things that people never think about your trademark is an asset. I would say it this way, anything that you could sell if you're selling the business, OK, so you could sell your trademark, right? So you sell your business, you sell the trademark with it. You sell your software that you've created or developed. You would sell your website. So that's something, you know, people expense all this stuff out. So they just throw it on the, the P&L and expense it out um, instead of putting it on the balance sheet and then depreciating it and looking at it as an asset. Um, of course, if you have inventory, if you have equipment, um, you'd be surprised. I talked to people. I just talked to a gal. They completely renovated their building and they expensed it all out. And I said, no, no, no. Leasehold improvements. That's an asset because if you sell this building, what you put into it, you put, you know, 
different shelving in, you put a bathroom in, you completely renovated the floor and the light, that's leasehold improvements. You can depreciate that out, put that on the balance sheet. So just thinking about if I sold this business, what would go with it? And that is the product that adds or the assets that add value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And like, I mean, that could be a studio space. It could be anything. It could be an office. Now, and the other thing I like that you talked about in the book too, is when you have a product-based business, and I think this can go the reverse as well. When you have a product-based business, say you're a boutique owner, or say you own a houseware store, you know, home yep. decor store, something like that. You can offer services around what you're selling to yes. increase opportunities to make more money. And that's more you're 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 applying this fee to the time you're spending with this person to provide them with an outcome. But if you see that as value and they see that as value, it's not like trading your time for dollars. It's more like, hey, I have this extra value to offer and I can charge for this value that I'm giving. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a home decor store that I just started working with and I did my VIP day with her. So I always do that with my clients at the beginning of our year, I'll go on location and visit with them. And so she was telling me all about her store is gorgeous. And she said, we have this one client, she's our ideal client. She just came in, she bought a stuff. And so I said, I would come out to her place and I would just show her what she should get. And I'd help her design for free. And I was like, whoa, 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 <laughs> absolutely no on that right? That is opportunity for high margin value products to sell, right? You can sell that design and that client wants that help. And mm -hmm. you undervalue the expertise that you bring when you just offer these things for free. And it's not just your hour in the house. It's the time away from the business where you could be selling other product. It's your time to get to her place. We have to think about all of these things. So I talk a lot about margin because my clients have inventory, but service-based business owners really need to watch their margins too, because they need to think about like, what does that hour on the phone truly cost me? If I'm a coach, it's not just, I mean, you and I are both coaches, right? It's not just about the five hours I spend a day talking to the clients. I spend a lot of time getting those clients, getting in front of those clients, marketing to those clients, doing the notes on the back end. And so all of that has to be worked into my pricing because otherwise I short sell my margin as a service-based business. So um, margin is a lot of times where we can find that extra net profit or that money at the bottom. Yeah. And I love this so much because you cannot look at an hour and say, my hour is worth $150. It's so much more when you're adding your price or considering your pricing. You're not yeah. just looking at that time on the clock. Yeah. yeah. I love that you emphasize that. Um, all right, where do I want to take this next? Let's do this. Let's switch gears for just a second, because I would love for you to talk about turning losses into wins. Yes. So John Maxwell has a book. Um, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. And I love that. I read that long before, you know, our journey took a downward spiral. Um, and that just really stuck with me. I think when you look at resilient entrepreneurs or we look at people that are resilient and we think, oh my goodness, they're so amazing. And how did they bounce back? There's a lot of intention that's built into the life before the catastrophe happens. So when you have something hard in life, which we are all going to have, some of us multiple times, like stuff happens, life is hard. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of if it's when. You can't go out and look for a friend group. You can't go out and look for those tools and things in the middle of a crisis. You have to have built that in with intention before that ever happens. And if you do, when you're in the middle of that, then you have a much more um, easy time of looking around and saying, how can I learn from what happened here? How can I switch gears? Now, I mean, there was a, a period of you know, I don't know how long, but I sat on the couch, like I had my bottle of Tums and my tissues and I felt sorry for myself and that's okay. Like we can all have that time, but it was okay. This crossroads of what am I going to do? Am I going to just keep sitting on the couch or I'm going to use all of my knowledge, all of my um, relationships I've built, all of the industry connections I have to do something again, only this time do it better in a much more efficient and effective way. Um, but I had built that mind of curiosity and resiliency before I needed it. 
so that when I had to tap into it, when I was at my lowest low, I already had that bank, those files, um, mental muscles built, if you would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. So Sierra, I'm curious, how did your faith help you? Like, how did, how has your faith impacted your journey? Because your journey yeah. has been challenging, but I, yeah. I mean, not that it's necessarily more challenging than what other people go through, but anytime we have a challenge in our own lives, it's a challenge and it's hard yeah. and nobody can discount that. So yeah. I would love to know how your faith helped you on this um, entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. I mean, I would love to go back to that deepest, lowest time. I don't want to, but I, I do want to. I've never felt so close to the Lord as I did in those hardest, hardest moments. And I think, you know, I've been I was raised in a Christian home, been a believer for years and years and years, always interested in spiritual things, but it doesn't mean anything till it needs to mean something. And, you know, some of the verses that we read in Psalms, like, oh my goodness, they stood out in a whole new way. Um, you know, the peace that passes understanding when you re you hear that verse all the time, when I was in the middle of that and our family was, and people were like, how are you so like calm? I was like, that's what that verse means. It passes uh -huh. understanding. It's not, you can't comprehend it. God just gives so much grace in a really deep moment. And so that's what I'd love to go back to. I don't want to go through the hardship again, but that was just super special. Um, and I think just what the biggest story or verses or scripture that really helped me through was the story of Joseph, because what we went through was very unfair. Mm -hmm. We had not done really anything wrong. I mean, a friend of mine said, Siri, you always have to look at, you know, a, a bad circumstance and say, what did I contribute? Because you don't want to say, well, none of this is my fault, right? We all pay, play some part. But a mm -hmm. lot of times things just happen to us too. Like people mm -hmm. do bad things. There's bad people, right? Yeah. And so a lot of what happened was very unfair. We lost our house while those store owners kept their stores. That was very hard for me <laughs> to say, I'm yeah. losing everything. This is my brand. We're losing our family home. And what you did was dishonest and you get to continue to operate your store. So the story of Joseph is what just resonated with me. Um, and the part that did was when his brothers came back and he said, I'm going to cry. Um, what God meant for evil or what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Uh -huh. And I just kept thinking about that. And so now looking back, I'm like, it's such a wonderful perspective to have that it felt so unfair and so wrong in the moment. And there was a lot that was wrong. Um, and while maybe those people are like, ha ha, we caught you. You know, we did all the stuff. God was like, but actually this is my plan because I want to use Sierra to help hundreds and thousands of businesses. And I couldn't see that at the moment, but I can see that now, just like in Joseph's story, he was put there, but he ended up saving so many people. Mm -hmm. And because he had that perspective, he wasn't bitter. And so that is, I think that's the biggest faith part of the faith journey that um, has stood out to me is just how God's given me the grace not to have bitterness but just to say that was actually God's plan. And how can you be upset with God? Right. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. And it, and it all worked out in the end. So, yeah. you know, you're better for it. And now hundreds to thousands of other people are better for it, which is yeah. so amazing. Okay. Yes. Let's go back just because we're almost out of time, but just really quickly when like you hear balance sheet, you hear profit and loss statement, like what should people pay attention to on those documents? Like how often should they look at those documents and how or what should they focus on when they look at those documents? Yes. So profit and loss, I'll give a quick overview. Profit and loss is like a rear view mirror. It's only going to show you what already happened. A balance sheet is a snapshot in time. So you can look at the life of, and health of my business as of today, as of December 31st. So balance sheet gives you a snapshot in time. And a profit and loss is going to give you the rear view mirror. So you really need to understand both of them because they do different things and they work in different ways, but they work together. So a profit and loss has five categories. You have your sales, your cost of goods sold, 
which in a service-based business would be like mats and subs, so materials and subcontractors. And then you have your gross margin. That's the difference. All of your expenses and then the difference between all that is the net profit at the bottom. So when you look at a PL, you want to look at it every month. You want to get one monthly. Look at it, just skim down. I always say just skim down and see if anything looks out of the ordinary. Why is that expense $10,000? It never is. What's going on with my net profit? Is my margin on track? Did I make my sales goal? And then a balance sheet is going to show you your assets and liabilities. So at the top, it's going to show you everything that you could turn into cash or is cash. Your checking accounts, your saving accounts, your assets like we talked about. And then your liabilities are going to be at the bottom. That's going to be whatever you owe to other people. So that could be accounts payable, credit card, business loan, family loan. And you want your assets to be much healthier or um, more vast than the liabilities. You want the liabilities to be as minimal as possible. Um, and then one thing for people to note, um, cause I always hear this, they come to me and say, I'm making so much money, but where's it all at? That was the client we talked to yesterday. I'm making a million dollars, but I don't have a million dollars. So I'll always tell them debt does not show up on a profit and loss. So if you have, let's say you made $10,000 last month in your business, but your debt payments all together, your credit cards, your SBA loan, all of that things, those things together is $12,000, that $10,000 in debt profit or cash can't cover that. And that's where your money's going. So you need to know that your debt is accounted for properly and then how much debt you're servicing. And you need to make sure that the budget you set is going to create enough net profit to cover your debt. Mm. Oh my gosh, you guys, that was a total crash course, but so, so valuable. And if you want more details on that in Sierra's book, she does outline that too. And she gives specific examples. Sierra, where can the listeners find you, learn more from you, even work with you if yes. they are a product-based business? Yes, I'd love to chat with you. Um, just head to to my website, sierrastockland.com. Um, you can find then my Instagram, LinkedIn, everything is linked. I have a lot of free resources. Um, of course, you can get my book on the um, on the website. The podcast is linked there. So sierrastockland.com is the best place to find everything. I love it so much. And thank you so much. You were just such a ray of light and I love your story. And I love thank the, you. all of the, um, the faith components your story and how you share that with us too. So thanks so much for being here. Listeners, if you know anybody with a product-based business or if you as a service-based business found this information helpful, please share the episode. There are so many people who need help and they don't even realize they need help and they're struggling. So if we can share, then we can help create that ripple effect in the world. Thanks for being here and I will see you all next time.